interim, let's send you all the way on down south, 1,600 miles to Scott. Hello everyone, you may have just seen a bird fly through the thick undergrowth there. We were hoping it would stick around. That's its calling. It's a orange-breasted bushrike and it's been lurking around here doing some hunting. So I'm hoping we are going to be able to find it and show it to you at some point. They're quite secretive birds and very beautiful. My name is Scott and it is wonderful to welcome you down to South Africa. We are in the Sabi Sands. It's a blazing hot sunny afternoon and I'm teamed up with Senzo on camera. Now I've got some exciting updates from the morning. Um, for those of you who weren't on the Sunrise Safari, there was a Ian Buck kill found this morning, hoisted up in a tree with no sign of any leopard in the area, and we guessed that it was either one of two sisters, Shadow or Tundi. And we were hoping that it was going to be Tundi that returned to the kill, and she did indeed return. Whilst we were enjoying breakfast, there was another vehicle that was staking out that area to make sure we found out which leopard was responsible for it and more importantly if it was Tundi that she would hopefully lead us to her cub thereafter once she had fed on the kill a bit more maybe she would go back to the den and interestingly for the third time that we've noticed now she took the kill down from the tree and towards the den site we know this because she took the kill down from the tree I thought she was just moving it into a shady area but she then kind of stopped it was very thick she was seen somewhere just up to our right but we actually saw her from the other side of the road uh, from where we are now from kind of a road we're down in a riverbed now and we got a tiny little glimpse of the cub and then she disappeared somewhere into these thickets so we guessing that she's stashing the cub somewhere in and around quite a few little gullies in this area and lots of thick vegetation so we've come here in the hope that she will pop out again so that's what we are planning for our afternoon we're going to stake this area out and with a little bit of luck she will pop onto the scene with that young cub it's a tricky area this because it is so thick um, we're not going to be able to get the vehicle exactly where we want to but that's testament to what a good den it is that it's kind of impenetrable Oh, Senzo spotted the bird again. Look at that. What a view. Well done, Sens. Is that not one of the most awesome birds you've ever laid eyes on? How oh, cool. You can see the way it's holding open its beak, that it confirms that it's a hot afternoon. Even the birds are panting. Well, I'm very happy that we got you that glimpse of the orange-breasted bushrike. Oh, here it is again. It's a bird we don't see very often, so let's ride this wave for as long as possible. You can see it's definitely hunting, looking for a meal. I cannot believe what good visuals we're getting of it. This is absolutely incredible. It's so close to us which is very unlike them. They're usually quite shy and secretive, and let's hope this is going to be the kind of benchmark for the afternoon, and not only will we maybe get spoiled with this incredible sighting, but also with the cub of Tandy, which is only about six or seven weeks old now. Okay, well, now that the bird has flitzed off, I think, vehicle and she would like to let you know what her plans are for the afternoon yes I am indeed another bird and I am a bird that can drive thanks Scott <laughs> hi everyone good afternoon we had this amazing male waterbuck positioned so beautifully and then this younger one came up and <laughs> moved him out of the way so we'll still take it young male waterbuck on screen at the moment it is an interesting afternoon we can hear some thunder in the far distance I think in the next two or three hours it's most likely going to rain I don't think it's gonna rain just at the moment and I'm very excited that Scott's finding of that steamboat kill this morning did result in Tundee that is absolutely fantastic because we've been struggling
trying to find where she is. Um, and Scott and I were just having a chat before we left on drive, and we're thinking possibly maybe she's not fully denning anymore, but just sort of moving the cub to wherever she makes kills, which makes quite a bit of sense. She's not too far from where we saw her on Christmas, um, but she's farther from where we thought she was going to be after the sighting um, uh, in the rain that some of the other vehicles had of her moving farther north. So yay, well done, Scott. So, so exciting. Okay, so I am Noelle. And this is Safari Live. As we know, you've met Taylor, you've met Ralph, and you've met Scott. And on camera, I have Ferg. So we've got minimal, minimal movement areas in there. So Ferg is thumbs upping and saluting and all of that. And don't forget, we're live, we're interactive out of uh, South Africa with myself and Scott and out of Kenya with uh, Ralph and Atela. So our plans for this afternoon is to eventually make it back to where we had Hasana this morning, the little chief, little Prince of Juma. I'm just waiting for it to cool down a bit. It is really warm. I would probably say it's about 35 or 36, uh, but yeah, that's just just to submit it's also very humid with that uh, thunder shower moving through <laughs> other than that i think i really want some elephants today so we checked twin dams and we checked treehouse amazingly no elephants but again elephants usually rock up where the thunder is before we even hear the thunder so they're probably farther <laughs> south and west of us at the moment Ooh, julia what is my most memorable moment of a safari live drive in 2017. Mongoose Black Mamba sighting with um, Senzo. My other was when Tan of those. Um, and then um, Jandre and I had an amazing sighting with the sticks on Twin Dam Wall. And then I have to say, anything that Ferg and I did during rehearsals, live and not live rehearsals, where we were chasing those wild dogs, all completely epic and amazing. Oh, and that hippo sighting where that other female was eating the afterbirth from the from the other female that 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 um, gave birth to that little hippo at Chitwa Dam top ones that I can think of now. I have a very hard time picking just one. Uh, I was trying to pick just 10 photos from this past year that I really liked and then I was going through I was like oh but that sighting was great. So yeah I'm, I'm very bad at narrowing that down. Um, but let's see maybe the last drive of 2017 allows us something even more exciting. We picked that as our number one so we're gonna carry on down the Milwaukee and try and hop from shady spot to shady spot and find hopefully specific about these, uh, these elephant sightings. Other than that, I'm also trying to see if we can pick up anything on Tingana. I know that some of you saw him going over the damn wall last night around 11 o'clock our time. And then this morning, I think the guys had a couple of tracks, but there was also lion activity. And then uh, we got sidetracked with Hasana and with uh, that steamboat kill that ended up being from Tundi. Um, Scott was saying she was in a little bit of a foul mood when he did catch a quick glimpse of her. And I have a feeling that's because Tingana might have come near where her cub is um, and she's just not ready for that yet so it's possible that he's around here summer although he does like to be our last minute leopard maybe he'll be our last minute leopard now some of the areas because most of the water holes have dried up here um, except for the large dam so I'm gonna check for, for nice little browsing areas and then We'll probably head over to Chitwa Dam and see what's potting there. Maybe we get a little bit of swimming ellies that side. Now I'd be curious to know what all of you are doing for New Year's Eve. I know some people like to just take it easy and some people go on uh, go all out, so send those through. Curious to know, I think I'll be having a little bit of apple juice with the crew and then I'll probably be asleep by nine o'clock maybe a little bit earlier. And then waking up to drive in 2018. All right, just coming around the corner here. We haven't done trees in a while, and these leadwoods are looking very beautiful. While we're repositioning to talk about this very stationary tree, let's head all the way back up to the Maasai Mara to Ralph, and let's see how his last drive of 2017 is going. Hopefully he's managed to... Thanks, Noel, and uh, yes, uh, the last 
game drive of 2017 indeed and look at this landscape it is just it's mind-blowing in the front we've got a, a mountain range which is just behind uh, the little town called Telek and, it, and in front of that and coming through now we've got a, a big wall of rain it seems that's coming towards us and we're following along with a small river line with uh, a lot of trees running along it but as I drive through here, I can't help but uh, reminisce and feel like I'm in some of the areas that I've driven around uh, and frequented in Namibia because uh, the parts heading towards the northwestern uh, sections of Namibia are very similar. However, the, the feel to it, the climate, uh, is slightly different because here it feels a lot more moist, um, not as dry as it is in Namibia, and not quite as hot either. And obviously, with the with the amount of clouds that we have here, uh, totally different to that in Namibia because if, if Namibia only has this very rarely. So here we've just come across a small aggregation of animals and we'll just have a quick look because we've been driving for quite a while and not seen too many animals and Manu was actually mentioning to me that uh, it's looking quite different because I think the last time he was here it was full up with Plains Game being zebra and wildebeest so a little bit different at the moment where all the animals have moved off down into the Serengeti and so these are the stragglers and the ones that have stayed behind but, uh, lovely to see them out on the plains nonetheless and still very interesting to think that in, in not too long uh, into the new year and we'll start to see the beginnings of the migration once more but um, as we look out there with the gazelle and the topi and the zebra happily walking through we're going to be moving off soon and see what else we can find along these immense plains. And while we do that, let's send you on back to Taylor and see how she's getting on. Look at what we've got brewing in the distance and I hope it doesn't hit us, but I hope it does pass through the Masai Mara because we desperately need the rain. But the winds are howling down there that it's picking up so much dust and sort of swirling around there was one bit of dust that's died down now it actually looked like it was a tornado in the distance it wasn't it was just so much of it it is scary there's lots of lightning uh, there'll be torrential rain we are going to be hit by this storm i just hope it doesn't cause a flash flood uh, we are staying at Olosheki, obviously i said that to you which is just in the town of talik and the talik river will then rise quite a bit and we've got to cross over a bridge in the Talek River which makes me a bit nervous. Okay well we're driving around here now in almost in the area of Hamakop hoping to find some cheater of sorts. I'm going to find a car and hopefully they'll tell me where exactly I need to go. No we'll get to see what uh, she got to saw on Christmas Day. So Ferg and I have managed to find a little shady spot for us to sit, but also so that you can see the beautiful blue sky with a little bit of clouds and how vibrant green the leaves are of this leadwood tree, and also just the contrast with that with the very light colored gray bark. So I'm gonna let Ferg work his very wonderful magic with all the angles he wants to go at because this leadwood is just beautiful all around. I really enjoy all the textures um, that, that it involves, as well as the fact that it's such a long living tree. So we're coming to the end of one year and the beginning of another year. And I think for a lot of us, as we do this, we start to recollect our thoughts and go, oh my goodness gracious, I can't believe I'm this old, and what have I done with my life? And it can sometimes be a little bit, I guess, sad about it. But this tree actually makes me quite happy and very hopeful. It's a tree that can live for over a thousand years. Um, and it's just amazing. It's a very hard, hard wood. And the leaves are not very palatable. It's eaten sometimes when it's a bit younger. It has a bit of spines on, on the branches there. And it not only protects itself, but it also does a lot of work for the environment. So as it starts getting older, parts of it hollow out, and after it has uh, stopped growing and has died off after hundreds and hundreds of years, it also then becomes a home for many species. So it's a home for species whilst alive, and then you can see there one that's died, and a home for species whilst it's dead as well. And then when 
think of all of the organisms that it allows to carry on living far after it itself has lived. It just boggles my mind. And then once it falls over, it takes about another 50 years to decompose. And that decomposing then gives more organisms a chance to live and evolve. And then all the nutrients go into the soil and then create more habitats and more homes and more food and resources for everything around. So this is my philosophical movement for the game drive. Um, it's a conserved tree inside of South Africa, but it's not a conserved tree in other parts of Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa specifically. So we talk a lot about rhino poaching and we talk a lot about elephant poaching and we talk about how wild dogs are endangered and we talk about the declining numbers of lions but we don't necessarily talk about how the species that make everything important. So a tree like this will be a place for a leopard to put a kill in. A tree like this will uh, give homes to birds that alarm call for leopards walking past um, that then might save a kudu which then might have another baby for another generation going on. It's a place for for elephants to rub their backs on after they've been in the mud to help an itch and help take parasites off, or the same for a rhino or a buffalo. Uh, there are many, many, many insects who will utilize the flowers that are on this tree. It's, I mean, I could keep waffling on and on and on. So in other parts of Africa, it's cut down to make furniture, and because it takes so long to grow, the, the species in general is actually in decline as well. So we must also think about not just the big and beautiful and wonderful and charismatic, but also something like this gorgeous leadwood tree. So I think you all have heard my philosophical waffling on for, for long enough. Tom, you'd like to know, are there any alien tree species in Juma? Tom, as far as I know, most of the alien tree species have been taken out. So an alien tree species would be something like a jacaranda tree or a blue gum, also known as a eucalyptus. We do have a few plant species. Uh, I see prickly pears every now and then, um, and some coquibos and a few things like that um, that are alien invasives. But no, not, not too many trees. This is pretty, pretty beautiful, wild, indigenous area that we're in. Oh, there's that texture. It actually reminds me of elephants, the texture of this, and you can actually see the rubbing from where an elephant's been passed there. Thanks, Ferg. Alrighty, it's starting to cool down slightly. Could be because we're sitting in the shade and there's a slight breeze that's coming up there. You can see more of that mud from elephants coming past. So I think what we'll do from here is we'll start heading more east and then a little bit more south and end up towards Chitwa, Chitwa Dam in front of Chitwa Lodge and see what moving species we can find for you. So we'll go from the flora to the fauna. All right, onward and upward, Ferg. Alana, very good question. So Alana, you're 14 years old and you're watching the show right now. I hope you're having a very good time with it. And you'd like to know what is a subspecies? So Alana, we are homo, we're humans, but our scientific name is Homo sapien sapien, okay? So basically what that means is that there was a species called Homo sapien, and then we are a, a species that has branched off of that like a cousin, yeah? So Homo sapien, we have beast here and the and Ralph is a um, subspecies, a cousin of, of that species. So they can technically interbreed. So if we had any Homo sapiens around, not just Homo sapiens sapiens, we could technically interbreed with them. Um, I'll give you another example just to show the difference. We get white rhino and black rhino um, in, in South Africa. White rhino and black rhino have different species names. So one uh, white rhino is Cirathinum sinum. I always mispronounce that, but that's the best I can do. And the black rhino is Dicerus bicornis. So those are different genus and different species. They're both rhinos, but they're not subspecies of either one. They cannot interbreed. Um, if that none of that makes sense, Alana, you must let me know, think about it, and then send through another question if you want me to explain a little bit more, because this is, I love this topic. It's a fascinating topic for me, and I'm very happy to carry on the conversation, but think on that, and then let me know if you want me to expand a little bit as we carry on through the beautiful Bushveld. I'm gonna come up onto a little bit of a rise here. 
and then you all will be able to see what we're talking about with hearing that thunder and the possible rainstorm that's going to come through in the next couple of hours. I just want to move into a little bit of a gap so Ferg can show you properly what we're talking about with this front coming in. There we go. I think that works pretty well, Ferg. So on our left-hand side, we have blue, blue, blue sky with hardly any clouds. On the right-hand side, you can see the wall of moisture and, and cloud coming through. Um, I believe the question was, why in Sabi Sands are lions fewer in number than leopard? Um, it's not the case that they're fewer in number than leopard. We just happen to be seeing quite a lot of leopard recently. Um, and one of the reasons why we're seeing quite a lot of leopard is the fact that the lions are in different parts of their territory. But continent-wide, sub-Saharan continent-wide, uh, we don't know the full numbers of leopards continent-wide at all. We do know roughly the number of wild lions. So there's less than 20,000 wild lions left. There are one or two reports that say it's closer to 30,000, but I'm more trusting in the, in the lower number um, and for leopard we're not we're not quite sure it could be a little bit more than population numbers tend to peak and valley in a similar fashion uh, almost in tandem not necessarily all the way in tandem but almost in tandem as opposed to a cheetah um, who's our other big cat on the continent so leopard and lions will peak and cheetah will valley and then they'll go like this across good question all right, so you can see that, that beautiful um, front that's pulling through here, and it's starting to get gray in the background. I was taught as a child that when wind starts pulling through and it and they always laugh at me, but I'm actually watching these trees do it now. You can see on, um, oh, it's not a Shambok pod, with this wisteria that's just in front of us here you see how the leaves are showing their backside because of the way the wind's blowing so instead of sorry about that folks not sure what happened but uh welcome back and uh look at the lovely view that we have coming out but we're getting a little bit worried that we might be getting wet soon because we seem to be getting surrounded by the storm but we'll uh, we'll continue driving nonetheless and hope for the best we're aiming for that uh, little light patch in in between the storm just uh, hoping that there's not too much rain in the middle but that's our best bet so we're taking our chances and racing for the middle but we'll obviously stop if we see anything exciting along the way we've been looking out all the while for cheetah so it's still utterly beautiful even with the rain approaching we need it i think a little bit dry at the moment but a little bit of rain never hurt anyone we'll just make driving a little bit more difficult this seems to be quite a, a bit more clay soils in this particular area and these black cotton soils as well so i can see that after the rain could be a little bit slippery and slidey get very interesting and test your four by four skills when to use your differential lock and your low range we're just trying to take the right road which leads us there are a lot of different little two tracks just to give you the feel of how it is So folks, with this approaching storm that you can see in front of us, uh, I'm pretty sure it's half the reason as to why we've got some problems behind the scenes. Signal is getting a little bit low, but the tech guys are going to work all over it and uh, we're going to send you to the mountain camp just for a little while while they get the problem fixed.
Apologies for that short break in the safari, everybody. Evidently, there were some technical issues, but our wonderful tech team, both here and in the Mara, have resolved it somehow. Don't ask me how, but at least we are back on safari. Now, I've made a decision to leave that area where I was hoping Tundi and her cub were going to poke their head out. It's simply so, so thick in there um, that I don't think it's worth our while sitting and waiting. Um, I've also got this kind of sneaky suspicion that she might be moving the cub to kind of satellite dens, if you could call it that. Temporary hideouts that are close to her kills, which is a little bit premature. Uh, it's a bit premature for her to be doing that, but I mean, it was also not premature, but a bit out of the ordinary that she took some kills back to wards her cub, and the same thing happened this morning. She took her cub was hiding out, which doesn't really happen. Anyway, um, we may poke our head in there a little bit later this evening once it's cooled off because then it'll be more likely that two of them are active right now. It's still thought that they are going to be doing not a whole load, I'm guessing. So I think it makes sense for us to kind of drive around, look around, see what else we can find and return when it is a little bit cooler. What I would like to ask of you is to just monitor the Juma dam cam very closely because there's a strong chance that Tandy is going to go for a drink after eating Steenbuck all day and being so hot, so I'm sure she's going to want to quench her thirst, and that is the closest spot. She's not too far from the Juma waterhole. Very good, we are going to send you off to Noel with the Batalure. So, sorry about those little breakups we had there. The weather is stormy both ends of, of both of our sites, so in the Mara and here, so it does affect the internet every now and then. Sorry about that, but in our travels we have now found this beautiful battler just sitting in the shade of a knob thorn tree. And you can really, really see those colors we were talking about this morning. Um, as you know, it's one of my favorite eagles. And Scott's also been getting some nice sightings of battler as well. So, Sunny, we got interrupted a little bit about your question about what you think which animal has the most sophisticated uh, communication. So, I'm an animal can be anything from an insect to a reptile to a mammal to a bird. So, I'm going to choose a mammal species and an insect species that I think have pretty sophisticated communication. For me, that's going to be for a mammal, elephants, and then for an insect, it's going to be honeybees. So, honeybees do these really interesting dances and figure eights. Uh, to show direction to the rest of the hive as to where they've found a food source. Um, and uh, I, th I think it's absolutely incredible, this, this special little dance that they do to denote direction and, and to pass on information. And then for elephants, we were talking, we've got thunder that keeps coming in the distance, and the louder it gets, I am going to try and, and get it on camera for you so you all can hear it. It's a little bit far off, it's just a low, low rumble at the moment, almost like a train in the distance going past. Um, so it's a little bit too far for us to hear. Elephants can hear that way before we can hear that. They also have um, infrasound, subsonic vibrations through their feet that can go up to 60 kilometers, six zero. So they can communicate amongst different herds over quite far distances. Um, and there's there's still a lot of study to be done on, on the, the way that they vocalize. I've talked about my friend that's in elephant research and I asked her the other day for a bit of information on that and she is saying that they need a bit more time to be able to the the anatomy the inside because they haven't had a lot of, of chance to do a lot of work on that and I know there's a few places that are doing some great studies so I'm waiting for her for more updates and now as we leave our battler and head more towards Chitwa Dam let's head back up to the Maasai Mara where Taylor has an amazing surprise for you apologize publicly <laughs> for all the bumping and bouncing that we've been doing this afternoon but it's definitely been worth it this is the f have you seen these boys before right Archie has never seen the fast five or they're also known as the musketeers and they're all together 
and I chatted to another guide uh, a little while ago while we were trying to evade the storm and he mentioned that earlier on today uh, well not actually not earlier on recently they were trying to chase around and catch a young zebra foal but weren't successful so that's really good news for us now there are plenty plenty animals around here from zebra to topi to impala thompson's gazelle you name it it is here the only thing i haven't seen however is some wildebeest but that's okay there's plenty of other things that they'll eat and it's fantastic hunting weather at the moment uh the Clouds are rolling in thick, obviously we've been watching the storm. I'm a bit hesitant to say whether we're going to get rained on or not because I don't want to jinx us. Um, and then of course, as you can hear, it's howling. I know the wind must be gusting at about 45, 50 kilometers an hour quite easily. And they're quite far away from us too. We're gonna give these boys lots of space. <laughs> Uh, Sharon, you said Taylor the cheetah queen. No, 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 no. It's still Scotty the cheetah man of Africa, and it always will be. I'm, however, not the cheetah queen. Uh, I do enjoy spending a bit of time with them, that's for sure. And I think we can expect some exciting things this afternoon. Now, we just need these cheetah to edge closer and closer. The next set of animals that I can see, we are sitting in a bit of a depression, is kind of where these cars are. Just behind them, there's a lugger. This is a very popular lugger. This is much the exact same spot where we had that interaction with the lions we had the male lions roaring here we had the mating gerbils not too far from here this is the hot spot this is where it always happens so they're gonna have to head across that lugger and then go across the other side and then from there they'll decide what they're going to hunt but for now they're just sitting they're staring I actually want to see where exactly their eyes are focused but they're in the middle of the open area though I'm so sorry, Nikki. Nikki's directing now. The gremlins attacked Mara too much. I couldn't hear you because the wind is so strong. I have my volume turned up so loudly that I can still hardly hear you. They're all staring in the same direction. I think they're dreaming of a zebra. I think that's what they're hoping to catch. Scotty says that I can be the cheetah man of Africa's assistant. Thank you so much. I'm like a researcher. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. <laughs> I'll take that position, no problem. I'm fossicker in chief and finding insects for James and then the assistant cheetah finder when Scott is not here. Very nice roles that I've got <laughs> to Wild Earth. <laughs> I'm excited to see them. I am going to be very kind though and tomorrow morning I'm going to send Ralph in this direction so that he can come and have a look at them and then Archie and I will hopefully find some other cheetah in the area. We might go towards the Talek then and see if we can find Mal Malaika and her two boys or Imani's daughters. I don't know if they're still hanging around there. For Big Cat Week though, I'm pretty sure Malaika was still about in that area. So yeah, so that's kind of the plan. The whole car is rocking at the moment. That's how windy it is. I feel like it's going to actually take off. And there's also apparently a big pride of lions not too far away from here. I could see them in the very far distance when we were driving in. There was about 30 cars with a cheetah and about 35 cars with a pride of lions. So there's lots and lots and lots of animals around uh, this side, uh, which will be quite cool tomorrow morning to come and explore. I think Ralph will have a lot of fun around here. No, I believe you're all saying thank you very much for finding a fast five. It's a great, it is a great way to end the year, most certainly. If they'd only just get up and catch us one last meal. Can you imagine if we have a hunt at 6.05 Eastern African time? 2017 31st of December that would be pretty epic that would be good leaving 2017 with a bang it really would but they're gonna have to get on the move if they want to go any further they haven't even popped their heads up or changed direction or anything when we got here we saw them walking and then they kindly sat down you know the cats love to just sit and do nothing when I'm around I don't know what it is I'm even wearing my lucky jacket which we, we think it's lucky we're not actually sure we all have them on today Archie has got his on too uh, but sadly no moving just yet for the cheetah they're still just fast asleep Proud cat mama 
Emma, you're wondering whether the wind and the rain has got any advantage or disadvantage to the cheetah hunting. It most certainly works as an advantage. And, and the reason for this is that, that they can move fairly quickly now. Um, and that the same goes with lions and leopards and any other predators without really having to worry about making too much noise. They've got the wind to muffle sound for them and the rain. You can imagine when it's a torrential downpour, it gets in your eyes a bit, you can't really concentrate, it's not nice, it's all, again, it's loud, you can't hear. So all these factors work in the favor of the cheetah and unfortunately not so much for the prey species. But the wind is swirling at the moment. It's not sort of going in one definite direction. Uh, I, there's gusts coming from all around the car. So that could kind of work against them. If uh, they get too close and within a couple of hundred meters and the wind changes and the zebra and the topi and all the other animals pick up on the, the scent, they're gonna start panicking early because the weather is like it is. And they might be a little bit on the weary side and, and then the cheetah won't have as good of a chance. But if you look over here, just to the right, something here a little bit later. Look at all the zebra from here all the way around. Yeah, the zebra. Now, I know, Pam, you're wondering which is the dominant male within uh, the cheetahs. Uh, I haven't spent enough time yet, but everybody seems to think it's D'Artagnan, and D'Artagnan has been given that name. He's the only collared male cheetah. You may have seen there was one cheetah with a collar around his neck. Um, so they said to him, I've seen him being bullied quite a bit. And I was saying this the last time, the last time I spent some time with these boys, there was one cheetah that was definitely keen and, and kept instigating the hunts. There's the topina as well. A few youngsters sitting on the grass, it would make a nice snack. So it's hard to say, oh, they're up. They're up, they're up, they're up. That's exciting, finally. Um, but they're constantly battling one another. You'll see them, they bully each other quite a bit. And um, like I said, I just haven't spent enough time with them to say exactly who it is, but from what everyone else says, they think it's D'Artagnan. Beautiful cats, though. So one is still, oh no, he's got up now. He's on his way forward. That's... That's D'Artagnan there, that one. Aren't they stunning? I'm just trying to think. I'm going to wait for them to move forward a little bit more before we make our next move and, and head on down the road to get a better position. I do want to try and jump in front of all the other cars as, for, you know, we, obviously if they're going to hunt, we want to catch a hunt. Or we need to make the decision if they get too close to the lugger, do we zip around and wait for them to cross the other side? Because I have lost them in this exact same spot. It was, to be fair, pitch black. It was dark, um, which is understandable but I think we might have to think about that now Julia you're wondering with a coalition of five cheetah would they be able to bring down a fully grown zebra um, quite possibly they they could indeed uh, they often take down fully grown wildebeest and a zebra would obviously have a bit more kick in it there's someone on safari enjoying the cheetah hello everybody enjoy your safari uh, so yeah they would be able to and because there's no wildebeest around maybe that's what they're going to be going for or are they feeling a little bit lazy when I say they're lazy I don't actually mean they're lazy they're gonna take the easiest opportunity uh, to catch something so if it means going for a zebra foal and having to hunt again tomorrow they don't look too thin then they're probably going to do that they just want to catch something quick and easy oh that's so cool I love it when they walk like that and you kind of get the skyline quite close to their heads it is so 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 beautiful not racing off just yet though but making their way down to that lugger. You know what we will do though is I don't think we'll sit with the crowds. I think we'll be clever. Uh, we know where the food is. We know what direction they're going in. Once they get closer to that lugger, we're going to zip around and, and get to the other side and wait for them to cross. Even if we don't see them for a little bit, that's not a train smash. I'd honestly rather have them where the action's going to happen than sitting and waiting and, and hoping uh, that they don't cross. Oh no, and also the rain is starting to starting to drizzle now. We've been waiting for it all afternoon. And the wind is bringing it in quite quickly. Very nice. 
Mm, yeah, let's go around because these guys are going to drive into where all those cars are over there and I'm not a fan of crowding animals. I don't know what's on the other side though, but I do think that they have eyed something out down there. So let's go across. We are probably going to have to put our rain covers down at some point, which is going to be a little bit of a nuisance, especially if these cats go on the hunt. Just keeping, just keeping an eye on them just to see what they're going to do if they don't change. Okay, I'm going to let all these other cars come through this crossing and then we will do the same. I'm going to send you down back to South Africa now. We're going from the fastest land mammal in the world to one that is slightly slower but could still escape your eyes. Well, they are slow, but uh, they did beat us to the action. Um, <laughs> if it was two tortoises that were actually mating, um, and they've just disappeared off, but that doesn't matter because you have the Musketeer Coalition on the move. Well done to Taylor for getting you guys into the right spot for that. And it looks like they almost disappeared down a kind of burrow or a hole into this large termite mound. So we're going to just continue on. Sadly, that moment was missed. Um, they were a little bit shy, which I don't blame them. They were midway through the throes of passion when we bumped. <coughs> Blessings to everyone. Happy New Year's. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, we were we kind of interrupted them and then they stopped doing their business and then thought to go and seek out some privacy. And I wonder if the musketeers are going to go after those zebra. Who knows? Well, time will tell. For now, though, you're going to head off to Noel for a quick update. Hello, everyone. We've made it to Chitwa Dam and you can see a little bit louder. Ferg and I are debating whether the rain's actually going to drop on us here. Um, I can see where some of it's falling far to our south and west, but I'm also debating. Now, we got an update about Hasana that he moved away from his termite mound this morning into the backside of Chitwa Dam, so I was just off on foot investigating, and then I heard some guinea fowls going, so we're going to go investigate that. Now, I really would like to get some of this thunder, and if there is lightning, lightning on here. We were talking about the, these big, beautiful cumulonimbus clouds that form this sort of anvil shape and as they form the anvil shape you get the friction inside the cloud that creates the lightning and the thunder um, in a very brief brief ooh small little bit of a hippo noise there. Now the rain that I can see falling is not directly in front of us it's actually just behind where this dead tree is and you can see how the color has come down and is the same to the horizon as opposed to the little bit to the left and where you start to see more of the different colored clouds. That's one of the ways you can tell where rain's falling. You can also smell it a little bit and so it's possible because it's been dry, even though the rain's been building up, um, that it's going to drop all the moisture somewhere else and then collect more moisture along the way and then maybe drop on us or maybe it just m might keep going through. Ooh. The thunder is getting louder. So the more we travel on looking for Hasana, we will get the chance to hear it. It's one of my favorite sounds in the bush. Okay, we're gonna come back to the dam itself. I really just wanna go investigate those guinea fowl noises that we had. Um, because there's a, enough moisture that's fallen, I can't drive all the way through these little pans at the back. I have to choose a side. So I blocked some of it and didn't pick up any tracks or himself. And then where the guinea fowl were calling were the back side. So we're going to make little loops. make little loops around and see what we can do. It's also because the cloud covers come through nicely. It's cooled down enough that if he feels like moving, now would be a good time. And then with this thunder coming through, Remember we talked about with our cats here in particular, they don't necessarily really like the heavy, heavy rain. So it's possible that he's going to start moving uh, using the thunder, even though it's still uh, quite light out to help with his hunting and the wind that's picking up to help with hunting. And I think, I think while I'm busy doing this and looking around, Ralph has one of my favorite antelope species in the whole world up in the Maasai Mara and I haven't seen it in a very long time. So let's go up to him so you can see Sub-Saharan Africa's largest antelope species.
Yes, thank you. And look, look at this, what we have unfolding here. I know the tailor's now been able to find the cheetah, but we've been able to find a lovely herd of, of um, Irland that are walking almost towards the storm. And we're starting to get rained on a little bit, but there's a lovely light at the moment. And remember, these are the one of the largest antelope that you get. Some of them being over a thousand kilograms. And so that would probably be about 2,200 pounds, which is a lot of weight for an antelope. But what's also incredible about them is that they can jump almost as agile. <laughs> is that uh, how you can say that? They are very agile, almost the same as that of a kudu, and they can jump over three meter fences with a two-step run-up and I've actually witnessed this so for such a big antelope they're able to jump very high and kudu and antelope are the high jumpers of the bush and they're the ones that we actually have to be very careful of when there's national parks or private game reserves bordering on national roads or public roads because when you drive there at night there can very often be kudu and eland on the road and they get very confused by the lights coming from the cars so they can very often jump uh, towards the light because they don't really know what it is they're confused and so you can have a lot of car accidents with these animals Coast Cider, you're wondering if their horns are used for anything else uh, except fighting. Yes, Coast Cider, these are very short, stubby, sharp horns, and they'll use them to defend themselves against any kind of predator. They're very adept at using those to stab at any uh, potential enemy, and so it can be a very good weapon for them. Very similar to that of Oryx or Chemspok, very straight, uh, but Chemspok being a lot longer and thinner, whereas the Irland, they're a lot thicker and sharper. So, very good weapon. But, folks, look at this ominous weather that is coming towards. We're pretty sure we're going to be getting wet very soon and we've just been trying to edge along it trying to stay dry but the winds picking up and we've seen a lot of lightning as well so very ominous and <laughs> I think we're gonna get wet very soon off over there is back in the sunlight there's the Olololo escarpment in the background and so we've come quite a, a distance during this this morning and in the early afternoon and uh, that's been now Wendy you're wondering if clouds produce uh, thunder yes Wendy absolutely this especially when you've got uh, very dense clouds like this because remember lightning uh, is formed through friction within the particles uh, of the clouds so as there is more particles and more friction and so you get lightning and then that noise coming from lightning being that of thunder so these big clouds we're hearing quite a bit of thunder and seeing the lightning it's very spectacular as the animals I think brace themselves for the storm that's coming and bracing themselves I think they just mentally get themselves ready for a little bit of a miserable time whereas the way we brace ourselves is we're gonna have to batten down the hatches on the Land Rover and get the, the sides up and and if it gets too heavy we'll even have to put the front down but we'll try our best to avoid the, the worst of it but these topi and the gazelle in the background they don't really have anywhere to go so they literally grin and bear it as the rain starts to fall here in the Masai Mara and the greater Mara reserve it is beautiful I must say even though it is a very ominous storm coming I'm starting to get blown away here but uh, I wonder if Taylor's been able to stay out of the storm but she's still got those cheetah and I think we need to send you back to her 
Look, Akira walking right past the car. I say, Archie, they're like, we own them. We don't. They're free. They're wild. They're coming right past us. We got the perfect... Quickly. Ah, sorry about that, everybody. Um, Dreamlands. Okay, what I'm going to do now is we had a quick close view. I don't want to show you the wall of cars here, so we're going to jump ahead now. And I'm going to try and get you another view of them. But we're going to today dodge the vehicles today. Have a prepped because this could get interesting. You never know what these cheetah cats as Scott calls them. <laughs> the kitty 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 kitties come to us. Come to us They'll come on towards us. I'm just shuffling in my chair. There's one coming towards us here. And maybe I'm just not sure what they're going to do. That's thunder. But There's a big storm ahead of us. I don't know how that's going to affect the feed of course like i said earlier we are sorry about all the breakup that we're having i'm not in a particularly good signal area at the moment and unfortunately uh can anybody confirm we have an action broadcast prepped please look how the posture of these cheetahs starting to change Let's go live. Right. Uh, okay. We're not going to do an action broadcast here, everybody, unfortunately. We wanted to share it with the whole world, but it's fine. You can just enjoy it then. But please understand that throughout this entire uh, section that we're in, it's not very good signal, unfortunately. So there is going to be quite a bit of picture breakup, but just try and bear with us as uh, this could get very exciting with these cheetah. Like I said, you can see how their posture is just starting to change now from their relaxed behavior earlier. Head lower than the shoulders. Looking. That, that. Hey, don't. No, don't sit down like that. Come on, you guys are so close. Inch closer and closer, please. Maybe someone will encourage. Because they are, because they are inching their way closer and closer towards a herd of zebras so the ones behind them are not the zebra that they're going for there's a quite a long line of them and the zebbies haven't seen these uh, cheetah just yet they have absolutely no idea archie are you ready archie's never filmed the cheetah hunt before we're definitely going to have an attempt but i think you should keep your eye on that because at any second they can go. I've had the most amazing sightings with these cheetah where literally at, uh, you're watching them, they've sat down like this and the next minute one starts sprinting. Let's see, they're getting closer and closer. They're probably about 150 meters away from the zebra now and that's not far, that's perfect. Remember these cats do need a bit of time, a bit of space to build up speed so that they can charge and in and catch something. See, the one just keeps plonking himself down. The other one looks like he's going to take a seat. That doesn't mean anything though. I wonder if they're looking for a foal. There's also lots of topi around. Although a topi will give a cheetah a run for its money because they're quite quick and not to say that they won't go for them because Scott's had an amazing takedown. <laughs> mm. 
Mr. Gohan, you say, you're apparently chanting and going, hunt, 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 hunt. I think everybody sitting in the sighting is shouting that. And of course, it is pretty spectacular what we're witnessing to see such a large coal coalition of cheetah. It's not very common. So I'm going to be on the cheetah's side this time around. They also need to eat and also cheetah are not doing so well. Obviously we're discussing, discussing the populations left in the wild which is quite sad that there's only a couple of thousand of them left these days. Uh, however there's plenty of zebra, wildebeest, tropi and all those other animals so it is important. And remember very wild dog even a hyena has got a better statistic at hunting uh, successful hunts uh, than these of cheetah or leopards or lions so come on kitty cats you can do it show us how it's done give archie his first hunt on the last day of 2017 that couldn't go any better it really couldn't i haven't seen again i haven't seen any youngsters yet they are oh, uh, actually i lie there's but to the left you'll actually see the young one and I wonder if that's what they're eyeing out uh, keep going where's it gone now it's in there oh there to the there we go it's just popped into the gap now there's one zebra that's much smaller than the others here we go a little bit to the right that's a topi that's not the same species of animal a little bit to the right there we go there's the youngster Maybe that's the one they're looking for. They could go now. They're close enough. Now they're about maybe a hundred meters away from them. You can also hear the thunder rumbling. This will be a bit scary to get stuck out in a lightning storm. I'm not going to be enjoying that, that's for sure. That is going to be terrifying. I don't think it's going to be a quick storm either. Hopefully it just keeps missing us. We seem to have missed the worst part of it so far. Did I speak too soon? Should I have held my tongue? I never do that. There's no filter with me. Okay, good boys. Keep moving. Keep moving forward because the zebra also starting to get away now. There's a big gap between the two herds. And I don't know who they're going to go for now. Now I'm confused. The cheetah also do this, though. And they stop and they look. They don't want to waste their time. They want to make sure the, the animal that they go after is going to be the best possible chance of catching something. Otherwise, they end up just wasting their energy. The light is also quite cool now. It's very gloomy. Just listening to the wind, there's something bouncing at the back there. It looks like, look like some Thompson's gazelle. I'm so sorry, Nikki. You whispered a question into my ear from June. I can't hear what you're saying. I also got bad comms at the moment. And uh, the lightning's getting a bit hectic. Um, it's very close. The lightning is actually right over the top of our head right now. I don't, don't particularly feel very safe. Now, Julia, you're wondering whether the zebra would protect their uh, foals, just kind of like buffalo. I'm so sorry we're having a bit of technical difficulty with that amazing cheetah sighting with Taylor. Hopefully we'll be able to sort it out a little bit, but it seems as if you're getting some excellent views regardless. We went to go investigate our guinea fowl sounds and then it turned into about 10 different species of birds and Ferg and I were circling around this tree and it's not the type of alarm calling you would get for a leopard, but there was definitely a predator of a sort and we were thinking that it was a snake and then all of a sudden out the bottom of the, the bush pops a really beautiful 
beautiful African hawk eagle uh, that had obviously killed something there and all the birds were mobbing him incessantly and chased him off. It was very cool. Unfortunately, it happened too quickly for us to get on a camera, but that's all right. It was a fun experience nonetheless. Hopefully, we'll be able to repeat it for you at one at some point. Now, we've continued on with our loop looking for a sauna. I haven't picked up tracks from where the guys were talking. No, that's a hyena. Sorry, I got really excited. <laughs> where the guys are talking about, he went into. But I have a general idea of where he is, and so I think what we're going to do is just keep looping around until he feels like popping his little head out, um, which hopefully should be soon, as the temperature has dropped nicely. So we're making another loop back towards the dam to go check another small little area. And then hopefully when we get to the dam, there'll be some activity with maybe the hippos or maybe some elephants. We'll just have to wait and see. Ferg's busy being my spotter at the back here, checking everywhere. Ooh. Scott, I think, from what I heard, is up near Biffle's hook. So let's go back to him and see what kind of an update he has for us. Well, sounds like some exciting stuff there with the musketeers, I must say. I am jealous. Pity about the shaky signal, but at least they are moving, and maybe they'll move into better signal. We've just arrived at the Buffelshook waterhole, and there's a very moody afternoon unfolding here. I can hear lots of thunder rumbling off in the distance. It is to the south of us, and usually... The bad weather comes from the north, so let's hope that it stays away and doesn't ruin our barbecue plans for this evening. And the resident hippopotamus, just relaxing over here. And Unfortunately, the team up in the Mara have decided to power down their vehicles because there's a lot of lightning in the area, and we would hate them to get fried the day before 2018 begins, so fair enough. We thankfully don't have to do anything of the sort just yet, but let's take a look to the south and show you kind of what's happening out there. So that's west, and then now we're moving towards the southern kind of view. And that's where the big, dark, gloomy car... Oh, was that a lightning bolt? I think it may have been. I just saw a little bit of a flash. I was looking away from the monitor. Just caught it out the corner of my eye. Oh, wonderful. Well, I'm thinking of slowly starting to weave our way back to the area where we saw Tundi this morning. <laughs> Monique, you just have uh, just jinxed the braai. Um, could well have. We do have a plan B though, Monique. There's a little area where a lot of the Juma staff almost have a, a, a braai running permanently. Um, and it's under a roof. So we do have access to a good spot. No, oh, which route should we take? Let's go up along the Buffalo so cut line initially. There's one road on Juma where we don't get signal, and that's the one down there, which is a pity because it's a beautiful road called Inyala Road North. So we won't go down there because then we'd have to say goodbye to you immediately. I must say, this stormy weather is definitely bringing a nice cool temperature so that's a plus Scarlett you'd like to know what is the most popular meat to barbecue in South Africa it's a tricky one but I would hazard a guess and say it's burrevors yes burrevors the reason being is this burrevors, or farmer sausage, which is essentially beef sausage with a bunch of different spices in it, is very, very popular. And it's usually always incorporated in a selection of meats that will be, be bried. 
You seldom go to a braai where there's only one meat on the grill. If you do go to one like that, you haven't been to a proper braai, there should be at least three different types of meat. Chicken kebabs, or we call them sasatis here, some lamb chops or fillet steak, and buravos. Something, something, and always buravos. So I guess that's probably one of the most popular and common dishes that uh, is grilled over the coals here. But you know, whatever floats your boat, guys get quite creative. They do toasted uh, kind of sandwiches called braai broikies, which is like braai breads, and you can get creative with the, the kind of fillings, cheese, tomato, onion, whatever you like, and you grill those over the coals. Those are a good starter. Uh, and the meats are endless. You can do just about anything on the braai, but yeah, lamb chops, pork chops, spare ribs, multiple types of different flavored buravors, fillet steak, rump steak, t-bone steaks, you know, it's just never ending. So it all comes down to the individual. Um, I think we're going to be doing some seafood kebabs tonight for some of the crew members who don't eat meat, well, domestic meat. Yeah, so those are our plans for this evening. Um, if any of you guys have got anything exciting that you'd like to share with us for your plans, do let us know. I'm wondering what Ralph and Taylor are going to get up to. <laughs> because they've left the crew and I've got a sneaky suspicion Taylor is wanting to have a party in Talek Town. She did have one a while back. <laughs> That a few of you would have been told about. So I'm guessing that's her plan. Other than that, I can't understand why she's decided to go across there with Ralph now. I mean, of course, they could just have a party with, uh, you know, Ralph, Taylor, Manu, and I think it's Archie on camera with, uh, I'm not even sure who the cameramen are at the moment, but the four of them could have a party at Olo Shaiki, the accommodation over at that side of the river but sadly I fear you may not be able to ask them what they're going to get up to because there's only 12 minutes left of their shift and I'm guessing they are running for cover so it's goodbye from them on behalf of me and happy new years and you'll just have to ask uh, Taylor and Ralph tomorrow morning exactly what went down we thankfully have got some reinforcements to our skeleton Christmas crew in the form of Wildebeest, a.k.a. Viem, which is his real name, <laughs> and Louise. So, very happy to have them back a day early. Really hoping to see Mvula, an old male leopard at some point in time. The first time I ever saw him, he was walking down this road towards us and he kind of actually just came off this little termite mound. Happy memories. Okie dokie. Now what would be an epic, epic treat is that we could hopefully see this tiny little leopard cub of tundies before the new year break. So that's what I'm going to head off and try and organize. You guys are going to be heading off to know what? I'm not too sure what's going on there. Everyone, Ferg and I have had to abandon our Hasana search because there is hectic lightning that's coming. We're gonna, I, I can't stop driving because we have this aerial at the back that allows us to give signal off so you all can see us and it is like a giant conductor for a lightning storm. It's why the Mara had to power down because their lightning was too big. We are trying to move away from the lightning. Um, hopefully we'll be able to give you some shots when we get out of this area just of that lightning and thunder that's coming past. It's a little bit tricky at the moment. I just want to get us over to Twin Dam side so that we can 
not be as close, although this storm is now gathering speed. So a worry with something like this, other than the fact that, you know, we have to be careful of the lightning just personally in our vehicle. Um, other game drive vehicles, you don't have to worry as much because you don't have that aerial that's at the back. Um, but something that I worry about with lightning like this, with no rain falling specifically right here, we saw rain falling to the south and the west. Oh, Ferg felt one drop. Ferg, don't wish the rain on us quite yet. We have, a, we have an hour left, an hour and a bit. Um, is that if lightning strikes without the rain, it can start a bushfire, and we're not we're not saturated with moisture at the moment here, so um, it's it's difficult. All right, we're gonna try maybe a little bit of a pan shot as we're driving here. It'll be a bit easier for everyone to kind of see what we're talking about, and we might just get lucky and get some lightning in that shot. I'm also hoping that maybe now that we've had to abandon where um, Hasana was, maybe Tangana pops up for us, or possibly we get something with Kachava. We are on a little bit of a bumpy road here, so please excuse any sort of vibrations that show through in the camera. You can actually smell, you can smell the nitrogen in the air from the lightning. It's interesting with the nitrogen cycle that aids in plant growth. A lot of plants need nitrogen. They need nitrogen and phosphorus in particular. Um, a lot of the atmospheric nitrogen that comes through and um, and gets into into the air and the ground and the soil via storms like this is very important. Just as a sort of side note for everybody, it also works. The nitrogen cycle also works. With Ooh, that was a huge thing of lightning. Guys, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to drive very quickly away from where we are. I don't want to have to power down and then it's just Scotty D, but yeah, we need to move. So sorry for that. Um, we're we're going to have to be Ferrari Safari away. And then we've got another vehicle that's in front of us. No! All right, Nikki, I think if I can't get away quick enough, we might have to power down for a bit. Um, I'm going to leave. Ferg, what do you think? Should we power down? Nikki, I think we're going to have to power down. Guys, I'm so sorry. We're going to have to power down, unfortunately. It's too close to us. So I'm not going to be able to get away quick enough. So let's go to Scott, and then we're going to try and get farther away so that we can power back up and carry on with everybody. Sorry. Well, seems like things are getting a bit hectic out there, not only in the Mara, but also further south of where we are. So, last man standing. Let's hope we make it through this. If not, it's been real. <laughs> so, the riverbed that we are going to go searching in is just up ahead of us here. Ah, oh, Duke Mason, you are going to be uh, having a turkey tomorrow, so you're busy pre preparing the stuffing for that. Sounds good. Very nice. Thanks for letting us know. Ah, Mario's having fillet steak on the braai, spare ribs, and of course, burvor. So Mario clearly knows what he's doing when it comes to a braai. Those are three good choices, Mario. What kind of a braai do you have? <laughs> That's the next question. Does it have an adjustable grill? <laughs> I love a bra with an adjustable grill. I just find uh, the use of the coals more economic and your ability to get whatever heat you really want by the ability to lower them. It's quite a popular bra in South Africa and I think it's an American bra actually called a Weba, which is kind of like a round bra with a lid, which are great if you're planning on using the lid and kind of like doing a roast smoky chicken in there. But a lot of the time I find the weeb is a bit limiting because the grill is in one place, which means you can only, you know, you only have a short window period when the coals are at the right temperature, which is, it's frustrating for me when I'm brying. Thankfully tonight I will not be brying. There is a younger, better brier than me. 
I tested him uh, at our last braai and he passed with flying colours. His name is Conrad, he's one of the new tech wizards and he knows what he's doing. He's also a bit OCD which helps because when braaiing, especially in, in bulk, you know, you've got to keep turning the meat all the time. It's a full on job. And if you don't, you'll get one side that's a bit burnt. But Conrad knows how to avoid that. Mauricia and Curious One, sorry that I'm making you hungry. I think I'm also making myself hungry. My mouth's watering. <laughs> Ooh. So, shame. A lot of you guys uh, in the States don't have the most opportune weather for brying at the moment. So I think most of your New Year's meals will be indoors. I didn't think about that, so that's not fair. We've been torturing you with the thought of deliciously smoky-flavored brie meat. Sorry. Okay, everyone needs to focus now and concentrate because we are getting into the area where, oof, a major bolts of lightning up there. But we missed it sadly. Now there's a little spot that I crept into earlier, which I think is going to be a decent spot for us to sit and wait. Shai Ahmed, you'd like to know if the tourists that uh, come out uh, on safaris can kind of cook food out in the bush and use the wood from out in the bush. Um, generally when tourists come out here on holiday they don't do anything, they don't lift a finger. Um, so they, yes, will be fed bright meat but they're not going to be doing it themselves. And where any given lodge uh, decides to get their wood is kind of their matter of affairs so some people will bring wood in other people will use the wood that's lying out in the field it all just depends but barbecues are very very common when you come out to lodges a lot of the lodges will also put on quite a big spread of wild venison so game meat uh, animals that have been uh, hunted essentially uh, the, from the wild and then prepared and cooked so it all depends on your camp though the one camp where I used to work was quite a fancy camp very expensive and there you I mean at bush breakfast there'd be like ostrich egg omelets and the bush brides would have just about everything cooked over the coals crayfish crocodile kudu a long list of things um, we would even sometimes have to steam prawns in a bamboo steamer for sundown or snacks. A little bit over the top in my opinion. <laughs> Especially when you could be watching a uh, lion wake up. We were forced by the general manager to go and steam prawns, which I guess was a big reason why I moved along. Very good. Mario, you do have an adjustable grill. And on another level, you've agreed that weebers are not so good unless you're roasting a chicken. As well as the fact that you don't like charcoal or briquettes, which are a little bit of a shortcut, yes. Um, in a city that I can understand it, where you don't really have access to really good hardwoods. So I guess if there's a will, there's a way you can always find some good hardwoods if need be. So, basically, just to keep you guys in the loop of what happened this morning, or refill you in, somewhere off to our right here is where we got a little glimpse of Tundi, this female leopard, and her cub. It's incredibly, incredibly thick, and if they're lying behind a bush or in one of the many little gullies that are in this area, we would never see them. But our only chances are if we kind of snoop around you a little bit and we might catch a tail flicking or an ear twitching which may give away their current position and then we can try and work out how to snipe a view but it's going to be tricky so i'm confident that there's nothing here did i just feel a raindrop no
Hello, Joe. You would like to know if uh, the Cape Buffalo's meat here in South Africa tastes anything like an American bison. And I don't have a clue. I've actually eaten neither of the two. Um, so I can't help you there, sadly. Um, with a lot of the wild meats, we are getting a few raindrops here. This is not a good sign. Although it doesn't look like there's much rain around us. Oh no, our bry master just come in with a report saying that the, the bry is no longer on the cards. Why not, Nix? I mean, I'm guessing it's because of the weather. <laughs> I don't think we're doomed just yet. Well, at least we've got a backup plan. At least the meat will be cooked over the coals. And yeah, there are a few raindrops falling, which means we are going to have to cover up, which means we're going to have to probably move a little bit out of this area into an area where we can hop out the vehicle without the risk of a leopard attacking us as she tries to defend her cub. So, oh, this is such unfortunate timing. Oh well, we do need rain though, so I mean, to be honest, who cares about our bri? We can still have a, uh, a good time this evening regardless of what happens, but this area really does need rain, so the more rain that falls, the better. Ideally, it could just wait half an hour or so for the drive to 